good morning. We're in New City. If you're joining us online for the first time, uh, be sure to click on the Start Here link and click Connect and fill out a virtual Connect card to let us know that you are with us and how we can be praying for you. So let's all stand this morning and hear our call to worship. And let's actually read our call to worship to, together this morning. Read the underlined portion with me. Not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. For the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Why should the nations say, where is their God? Let's read this. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. And we gather this morning to remember that the God we worship is completely different from us. He doesn't grow weary. He doesn't worry. He doesn't learn new things because he already knows all of the things. He is in the heavens and does all that he pleases. This glorious creator God made each of us and invites us to call him Father. And so let's lift our eyes to him this morning and let's lift our voices, reminding one another of who it is we worship. Oh, God. 
We were created to worship this God, the one that we just sang about. Instead, we turn and give our attention to just about anything else. Jobs, classes, relationships, kids, our phones, the news. There's no end to the places that we look for significance, hope, and meaning. We look to them and we ask, is everything going to be okay? Am I okay? If I lose my job, if my spouse lets me down, if I don't have friends, will I be okay? We look to temporary things and ask them to define what is good and what isn't. Paul describes this impulse in Romans. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Exchanging the glory of God for pitiful replicas. We do this every day. Let's pray together this morning, confessing that tendency of our hearts to pursue those replicas. I'll start and you continue to pray as the Spirit leads. Father, we praise you, the one true God of all things. You are glorious, holy, all-powerful, and still you invite us to come to you because you are full of mercy and grace. We confess we seek so many other things instead of you. We desire pleasure, comfort, success, and approval even more than we desire you. Thank you for your mercy. Spirit, teach us to set our eyes and affections on Jesus.
So by God's grace, he doesn't leave us on our own. From the very beginning, he knew that we would not worship him rightly. So he stepped in to rescue us from ourselves. Jesus willingly gave his life on our behalf, taking our place so that we could step into his. Because of his life, death, and resurrection, we are sons and daughters of the Most High God, welcomed into relationship with the God of creation. Let's read Paul's celebratory summary of the gospel from chapter 1 of Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Because of Jesus, we come to God as our Father, lavishly blessed and dearly loved, free to walk holy and blameless by the power of his spirit at work in us. So let's sing and ce celebrate Jesus together.
from the darkness into glorious light. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful. Grateful that you saw us in our need full of selfish desires and concerns and without any love for you. And you sought us out anyway. You determined before time began you would accomplish our redemption without any deserving on our part. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your willing sacrifice on our behalf. And Spirit, help us. Help us believe in the beauty and the glory of the gospel guide us in applying these gospel truths to every area of our lives. Make us more like Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you can go ahead and have a seat. Hey, New City. This morning we have a great opportunity to be a blessing to the rescue mission of middle georgia i want to take a few minutes to tell you about some of the ministry that they do they have three main areas of ministry one to men one to women and one to the community the men's program serves guys who are wanting to get out of addiction and homelessness uh, i've heard stories there of everything from guys that are addicted to opioids to being homeless to people that are suicidal uh, and the rescue mission reaches out and serves their needs, helping them really get back on their feet, regain dignity, uh, and integrate back into a, uh, a, a more normal life uh, in Christ. Uh, they have the opportunity to learn life skills while they're there, biblical manhood, discipline, um, so it's a great ministry. The women's ministry, uh, that, that program provides safe shelter to women and children that are coming out of domestic abuse situations, um, even recently expanded into women's uh, addiction ministry as well. So, you know, mainly they're working to establish safety for these women, break the cycles of abuse, learn what healthy relationships look like in Christ, and build their independence uh, through good employment. And then thirdly, through the community outreach, they serve tons of meals to the needy, uh, provide clothing, furniture, household needs uh, through the bargain center that you may be aware of over on Napier Avenue. And then that together with the barn center that's out on their Zebulon Road property helps to also fund the, the various ministries that go on. So New City's been involved with ministry at the rescue mission for the whole time that we've been in existence. People uh, have, have served there the entire time. I've served there since 2010 as a chaplain. Um, Mikey, Walter, and I have been uh, working together over there. Mikey leads music. I'll preach. Uh, and we just get to minister to these guys with the gospel of Jesus. Um, you may not know it, but <clears throat> over the years, We've had quite a number of their residents be with us, graduates to, to, to become partners of New City and serve at New City, which has been great. Um, let me share uh, just a few things that I've seen God doing there at the rescue mission over the years. I've seen men come to know Jesus through the preaching of the word. I've seen hearts of fathers who have had lots of regrets with what they did with their their families, but their hearts, their, their mission are turned towards their children. Um, I've seen guys connect with Mikey uh, through the message of the gospel that's coming through his gift of music. And I've seen men repent of sin uh, and even turn themselves into the police uh, it, it, when, when that's appropriate. I've seen the brokenhearted men whose families were murdered come to peace with Jesus. Um, and I've seen men dying of cancer to be able to approach their last day, knowing they're going to stand before Jesus with confidence because of the work that God's been doing in them and they are assured of. So New City, pray 
pray for the mission, pray for the staff that work at this difficult ministry with all of the ups and downs that they experience. Um, pray that New City can continue to be a blessing to the hurting of Middle Georgia through the ministry there at the Rescue Mission. God bless you. All right, well, good morning. Uh, we were showing that this morning because it is fifth Sunday, and every fifth Sunday um, it, it, during the year, we um, our offering on that Sunday goes to support one of the ministries that we as a church support. And uh, this month, that is the rescue mission. And so uh, we've been talking about it all month. Uh, I, I hope that you will give today. Um, as you leave, anything that you put in the buckets uh, will go uh, to the rescue mission. So um, I, I hope that you will give, give even sacrificially. It is a, it is a worthy ministry, and they do uh, a great job. Like Greg said, we've been involved one way or another with New City and some of our folks uh, since we started New City Church. So uh, we love the rescue mission and want to support them. Um, welcome to New City. If you're visiting with us this morning, we are glad to have you with us. And if it's your first time visiting with us, we are really uh, excited to have you. If you're visiting first time or 10th time and you've never stopped by uh, the Connect Desk, or uh, we would love to have you do that this morning. Um, stop by the bar, meet one of our Connect team members, uh, and if, if you would fill out one of our Connect cards, uh, just a little bit of information. I promise we're not going to show up at your house um, knocking on your door at dinner time. We will send you an email. That's it as a follow-up. Uh, you'll have a contact with New City, so if you need anything or you have any questions, uh, we'll be able to help you and answer those. Um, but in exchange for that, we have an amazing gift for you to go home with. It is a New City Church coffee mug. Um, it is the world's greatest coffee mug. So you do want to stop by and get that before you leave. Um, it will not only make your coffee better, um, but it will make all of your dreams come true. So stop by. It is worth filling out a card and getting an email. Um, that last part may not have been true. Or maybe it was. Uh, hopefully you got one of these as you came in this morning. It has our announcements, and there really are a lot of announcements, a lot of things going on. One thing that didn't make it onto um, our bulletin uh, is uh, our resources. Is Today is a buy one item and get a lower priced item for free. So buy one, get one free. Um, that's on any either of our resource shelves. We have one that's kids and family uh, and one that is other. And uh, either one of those or both of those choose from one from each. Um, buy one, get one free. Today is also the last day uh, to order a New City shirt or hoodie. Um, today is the last day to order a shirt or hoodie. Say amen if you got it. All right. That's most everybody. Um, today is the last day. So if you send Amanda a, a message next week saying, hey, I missed the deadline, I will go ahead and apologize on behalf of the staff and uh, for Amanda. We're sorry that you missed the deadline um, if you missed today because this is it. So go buy if you want a T-shirt or a hoodie. Follow the rules that are there. I don't know what they are. Um, but there are directions on, on how to do that. Chili cook-off is coming up, and y'all should make sure that you're there for our chili cook-off. A lot of fun. That's November the 13th from 5 until 8. Um, lots of things to do that night. Bring some chili. Uh, sign up. Let us know you're coming. Be a part of that night. I promise it'll be fun. Um, Parent-child dedication is on the following Sunday, uh, the 14th. So if you are interested in parent-child dedication, uh, let Amanda know so that we can plan on that as well. All right, we're in the book of Ephesians this morning. Uh, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. If you want to turn there in your Bible, if not, we'll have the verses, should have the verses on the screen. So let me set up where we're going this morning. Paul has painted a really detailed um, picture of what life should look like as we continue to grow in our sanctification. Now, sanctification is a, 
a theological word that we use to, to really just mean uh, us as individuals being shaped more and more into the image of Jesus, right? That is, that is our restoration. We are being shaped into the image of Jesus, the people that we were meant to be. So what Paul has been doing is, uh, in talking with the Ephesians in this letter that he sent to them, is just reminding them of the gospel and all that God's done for us in Christ, uh, and, and, and reminding them of how it changes our lives. So the church, um, that's us, we are supposed to be the kingdom of God present in a dark and broken world. We are, we are supposed to be people, like individually we are people who have been redeemed from sin, we're being restored, as I said, into the, into the people we were created to be, the image of, of Jesus uh, we look and, and live more and more like Jesus uh, together a, as his people, the church. Um, we are to be a glimpse of the kingdom present. So when, when people around us see us as individuals, they should get a glimpse of Jesus. Like, oh, this is the kindness and mercy and grace and love of Jesus. I see that in you. In, in our families, right, husbands, wives, children, the same is true. They should get a glimpse of the kingdom of God. This is what forgiveness looks like. This is what grace looks like. This is what family looks like. When it comes to the church a as a whole, and Paul wasn't really talking about the universal church. Paul was talking about the local church. He was writing to a particular church, the Ephesian church. When it comes to us, New City Church, we, we should be the people gathered as the kingdom of God present. So, so when people outside of the kingdom, people who aren't followers of Jesus, see us as a church, what they should see is a glimpse of life in the kingdom. Right? A life of justice, a life of righteousness, how people care for one another and love one another and serve one another and work together for the good of one another and for the good of the kingdom. Right? This is what people should see when they look at us. This is the gospel at work in us, transforming us as individuals, shaping us as God's community of people, the kingdom of God present in the here and now. Why don't we see it? I mean, that's what Paul's been talking about in this letter, right? Why don't we see it? Why don't our lives reflect Jesus more than they do? Why do our families at home not, not, not give glimpses? And, and they do, they do give glimpses, but, but maybe greater glimpses of the kingdom of God. Why do our churches themselves not look more and more and more like the kingdom of God? Why, if all of this is true as an, as an outwork of the gospel, as Paul has told us that it is, if this is true, why don't we see it? Paul closes out his letter with, with an explanation of that, and, and, and he'll tell us as well what we can do um, to make a difference in, in seeing that in, in our lives. Paul knew that the Ephesians would need more than a letter just telling them the truth of the gospel. He, he knew that they were headed into a battle, and they needed to know. They needed to know that they were headed into a battle. They needed to know who their opposition was, and they would need to know how to fight this battle. So this week and next week, that's what we're going to be talking about. I want us to pray together this morning as we talk about being ready for our opposition. I want us to pray together. Pray that the Holy Spirit would be good this morning to teach us. Pray that the Holy Spirit would be good this morning to open um, our eyes to the areas uh, of our own lives where, where we have listened to our opposition r rather than our Lord. So um, let's pray that together. Pray it for yourself. Pray it for the people around you. Um, pray that God would be glorified in us, New City Church, as more and more we look like um, Paul's desire for the Ephesian church. Would you pray that with me? All right, let's pray then. Father, we thank you for um, truly the, the opportunity to gather together and pray right now and to pray together, not just me pray, but us pray together. We are your children, and, and because of Jesus, we can do this, and we come to your, to your throne boldly and, and humbly as well. Father, we, we need help. Um, we, we, we need the Holy Spirit to quicken our hearts today. Um, we need the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to 
to see the areas um, in, in our lives that we have, we have listened to the enemy. Uh, areas where we have been blinded by lies. Help us this morning to see the truth and the beauty of the gospel and to see how it changes everything in our lives. Help us to listen to you and not to the thousand other voices around us. Help us. Help us to be the church that, that, that Paul wrote about. Help us to be the kingdom present in middle Georgia and beyond. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, uh, let's, let's uh, look at um, chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to read verses 10 through 12, and then we'll, we'll jump in. Finally, Paul writes, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Why are things in our lives and why are things in the church not what they should be? Paul is warning the Ephesian church, you have an enemy. We have an enemy. God has done much in and through Jesus, and he has called us to much. That's what we've seen and been talking about um, throughout this letter from Paul. And, and now Paul says, okay, God has done much. He has changed your identity. He's redeemed you. He's restored you. He has made you to be his people. And this is what it looks like to live that way. Now listen, before I close out this letter, stand firm against the schemes of your enemy. Stand firm against the schemes of the devil, against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Church, we have an enemy, and, and our enemy is Satan. Now, there are two extremes, even this morning here at New City. When, when, when you hear me say that and you hear me read it, that there is the likelihood in our midst that we have these two extremes. We see it all over Christianity. On the one extreme um, it, it is, is, is the group who basically sees this as gibberish, right? Like, like there really is no spiritual life. We, we've talked about it when we've talked about the Holy Spirit before. Like we recognize Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but that's about as far as we go in any relationship, acknowledgement, or, 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 or life with the Holy Spirit. The same is true here, right? Like, like we, we, we don't believe, we, we will admit that there is a devil or say, yes, there is a devil, there is Satan, but, but we, we, we leave it there. As if there are no schemes of the devil, as if there, there, there are no real demons or fallen angels or rulers or authorities or spiritual forces like Paul has been talking about who oppose God, who oppose his church, who oppose us. We, we live our lives and we would say, yes, there is a devil, but, but that's it. So really the way that we live our lives is as if it's just us and God, like just me and God. And, and any failure is either me or God. Now, the other extreme is that everything is Satan, right? Everything is the devil. If it happens and it was bad, the devil made me do it. Or, or the devil did it. The, the, the flat tire that I got, it was from, I don't know if you all noticed, I use that one a lot because I get a lot of flat tires. It's Satan. Satan put that nail there, or, or it's the devil just trying to get me down, or, or, or whatever. Here's the truth from Scripture. Satan is very real, and Satan is very active. And what the Bible seems to teach, now you have to piece things together from all of Scripture in, in building an understanding of, of who Satan is and what he does, but, but the Bible seems to teach that Satan is a fallen angel who was created by God and who wanted to be God. It, it was Satan who tempted Eve in the garden and later uh, tempted Jesus. Satan's desire has been from the beginning to overthrow the kingdom of God and to establish his own kingdom. 
Satan was joined in his uh, fall from what we seem to see in Scripture by other angels who rebelled against God and, and continue even today to work against God's kingdom. So whatever God is building and, and, and trying to build in his kingdom, Satan and his rulers and authorities and, and principalities that are working with him are seeking to overturn. They are seeking to set up his kingdom rather than God's kingdom. Now here, Paul mentions Satan. He mentions principalities. But in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 that we've already covered, Paul adds to that group two others. He adds the world and he adds our flesh, right? So the world, the flesh, and the devil, those are the things that are constantly um, coming against us and against God's kingdom. The world is just the broken world and all of its systems and, and laws that we, that we live in. Uh, the world that we live in is, is broken, fallen, it is evil. Satan is called the God of this world, right? And so our world systems are not godly systems, and they are constantly pulling us away from God. Our own flesh, that's the desires that we have, the desires that we have for power, the desires that we have for comfort, the desires that we have for satisfaction. Our own flesh regularly pulls us away from God and the kingdom of God. So we have the world, the flesh, and the devil always pulling at us and pulling us away from God. So, so while I don't believe that everything bad in our lives or all sin in our lives is the devil doing it or the devil making us do it, I do think, church, in this warning that we have from Paul, we must, 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 must recognize the reality of Satan and his schemes against God and God's people. It is very real according to the Bible. Now, this is who um, the, the, the Bible says that we battle when he talks about Satan. Satan means adversary or oppressor. The word devil means slanderer, so he is a slanderer. He's called the evil one, and what's meant by that is that he is the epitome of evil. He's called the serpent. He is cunning and crafty and treacherous. Um, he's called the great red dragon. He is a, a ferocious, uh, fearless fighting or fighter. Uh, he, he is the accuser of believers, meaning that he, is, he accuses us as believers, whispering in the ears of those who are free and forgiven that they are, instead of free and forgiven in love, that they are bound and dirty and unworthy and despised by God. He is the tempter. Again, tempting Eve in the garden, tempting Jesus in the garden, tempting us often as well, tempting us away from God and away from the truth of God's word. He's called the ruler of this world or the God of this world. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul said that he is the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that works in the sons of disobedience. He is the chief of all demons. This is what the Bible says. Church, we have an enemy, and our enemy opposes God and opposes the gospel. Uh, we have an enemy who will not only use the powers of darkness against us, but he will use our own flesh and the broken world that we live in um, against us and against God's kingdom as well. So let's talk about how our enemy attacks um, and what I want to do is go through some of the major things that we've talked about in the book of Ephesians, um, some of those major areas of transformation that the gospel brings about, and I want to talk about how the enemy attacks those specific areas. So, um, in the first couple of chapters, Paul focused really heavily um, on, on the gospel itself. So let's start with how our enemy attacks the gospel itself. Now, Paul tells us that God has done an amazing thing for us through Jesus, right? Jesus lived the life that we can't live, perfect, holy, righteous, and pure. Jesus lived the life that every one of us failed to live and that no human besides him has ever lived. Jesus did that on our behalf, lived the perfect, righteous, holy life. Jesus died the death that we deserve, right? He paid the penalty for sin that should have been ours. On the third day, Jesus was raised from from, from death, defeating death and sin and Satan. Again, this was on our behalf. He defeated sin, defeated death, defeated Satan on our behalf. 
So when we come to him by faith, this is the good news, when we come to him by faith, trusting in his work and not our own works, then we are forgiven of our sin, we are redeemed from sin, we are restored to a right relationship with the Father, we are transformed from enemies of God, and we are made sons and daughters of God. This is the good news of the gospel. That through our faith, Jesus forgives, redeems, and restores. We, we are adopted into the family of God as sons and daughters of God himself. Now, Paul is adamant that, that this work of salvation is not our work. Paul is adamant in chapter 2 as, as, as describing us as dead, right? You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now, listen, when you are dead, what can you do? Nothing. And that is completely the point that Paul is making. You were dead in your trespasses and sin, and there was nothing that you could do to redeem yourself. There was nothing that you could do to restore yourself. There was nothing, nothing, nothing that you could do. You were hopeless but God. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, the great love with which he loved us, that he loves you with, because of that great love, he made us alive together with Christ Jesus in Christ Jesus. Right? The good news of the gospel is not that, that, that you got it together. The good news of the gospel is not that you tilted the scales in your favor because you did enough good works, because you attended enough meetings or walked enough old ladies across the street. The good news of the gospel is that you can't ever do that, but Jesus has done it for you. That's the good news of the gospel. He did what you and I could never do on our own. And Paul says, by by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. But listen to me. Your enemy will tell you that's a lie. Your enemy will whisper in your ear over and over and over again that Jesus didn't really do that. That God doesn't really love or care for you. That you're not good enough for God to love. Worse, our enemy will remind us over and over and over again of our failures. Remember that time you did this Remember how many times you said you were going to get it together and you haven't gotten it together? Remember how many times you've told God that you would do something and you didn't do it? It's too late for you. You're too far gone. That's what our enemy says. Our enemy says that God is still angry with you. The gospel isn't real. Our enemy destroys the good news of the gospel by telling us again and again that we have to earn our own salvation and we have to earn God's love. And and for many, that leads us to despair because we try and we try and we we hear. We hear the enemy and we believe the enemy and so we, we try to get our life together and we try to do better and we try to do enough good deeds to tilt the scales in our favor and we fail again and again and again and again. I've been there and it, it is miserable. Because you reach a point where you realize, I just can't do this. So for many, for many, this this lie of Satan leads to despair. And and for others, for others, it leads to pride and self-righteousness. Because what the enemy whispers to you, because the enemy knows you, you are good enough. Look at how good you are. And look at all the good things that you've done in your life. Those other things, those are small things. Don't worry about them. In fact, the enemy will point you to other people around you and say, look how bad they are, as if they are the standard. See, our enemy lies to us about the good news of the gospel. Our enemy lies to us about our own works. And and he whispers, we are are good enough, we are are worthy enough because of our wisdom, because of our knowledge, because of our works. And, And when he does... When he does, whether he does that to the person in despair who is working as hard as they can to save themselves or the person who thinks they've done enough work to save themselves, when we, when we listen and believe our enemy, we have no need for the gospel. It's all up to us. Sadly, in our despair or in our pride, we are drawn away from Jesus. 
Even more sadly, we are drawn away from Jesus and we drag others with us. And rather than pointing people to the beautiful news of what Jesus has done for us, we point them to their own failures and to our success. The gospel is not Jesus plus works. The gospel is Jesus. The good news is that he has done for you what you could never and will never be able to do for yourselves. Our enemy attacks the gospel over and over and over again in our lives. Paul also talked a good deal in chapters 2 and 3 about how the work of Jesus, the, the, the gospel, is not just about us as individuals being saved and redeemed, but there is a corporate nature uh, to the gospel, and, and God has been at work through Jesus reconciling uh, not just us with him, but reconciling and restoring our relationship with one another. There is unity that comes from the gospel. Right? And, and truthfully, the only place that we can truly find the unity that we all desire is in the gospel. Now, much like our day, in Paul's day, uh, they were a very divided people. In the early church, the rift was between primarily Jew and Gentile. They hated each other. Jews hated Gentiles. Gentiles hated Jews. They didn't get along. They didn't want to be in the same place. They didn't worship together. They were a very divided people. For us, it's not so much Jew and Gentile, it's black and white. It's the color of our skin. Maybe it's our socioeconomic standing. We have wealthy churches, we have poor churches. We have black churches, we have white churches. Maybe it's our political views. We go to liberal churches or conservative churches. We are a divided people. And what Paul said is that in Christ, the dividing wall of hostility has been broken down. The dividing wall that existed between Jew and Gentile, the dividing wall that has existed between black and white, that dividing wall has been broken down by Jesus already. The good news of the gospel is not that if we do the right things and we try hard enough, then maybe we can be restored to a right relationship with our white brothers and our black brothers and our brown brothers and our yellow brothers. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus has already done it. He's already made us brothers and sisters. We still have to do the right things and we ought to do the right things, but we are brothers and sisters. In Christ, at every turn, our enemy tries to keep us divided. At every turn, every turn he works, he works against the unity that Jesus has given us. The church has failed miserably at understanding this work of the gospel. And because the church has not led in valuing every human life as bearers of, of the image of God, because the church has not led in proclaiming the equality and the worth of all humanity, our culture has taken the reins. Be because we don't speak the truth of the gospel and live out the reality of the gospel, then our culture has taken on the responsibility of doing it, and they do it in a broken, sinful way. And what they provide will never bring us to the unity that Christ has already provided. Today, because the church has continued to fail at living out this, this gospel truth of unity, it, it is our culture who defines who is worthy. It's our culture that defines what is worthy. It's our culture that defines who is evil and who is not. It's our culture defining the worth and value of people and the, the worth and value of, of, of relationships. And it's not based on the Bible, and it's not based on the gospel. And it will only lead to further divide. Now, our enemy looks to stir our division in, in, in so many places. Liberals are angry with conservatives. Conservatives are angry with liberals. Blacks are angry with whites, and whites with blacks. Even in the, the, the family of God, this family, our enemy tells us that those people are the problem those people those people are the ones that are causing it and those people could be could could be liberal or conservative right it's those conservatives that are the problem that's those liberals that are the problem it's those white people it's those black people
rather than fighting together for the kingdom of God, recognizing the work of Jesus and bringing divided peoples and, and making them one new people in Christ, rather than fighting for, for gospel unity, writing, rather than fighting for the kingdom of God, we are fighting with one another over power and supposed power, over who is right and who is wrong. We live in constant suspicion and blame, just as our enemy desires. He works to undo the unity of the gospel and to keep us divided and fighting and, and blaming one another rather than living as brothers and sisters in Christ. In chapter 3, Paul talked about the unity in, in, the, in the purpose of the church. The church has a purpose, and the purpose of the church, right, like the, the Holy Spirit indwells all believers, and the Holy Spirit has given us a gift. Uh, all believers have a spiritual gift as the Holy Spirit indwells and empowers, and, and that gift is to be used for the good of the body, for the building up of the body in love. Building up of the body in love means that we are reaching unbelievers and bringing them into our family, and we are loving them. And for all that are in our family, within our giftings, we are, we are working together to see that all believers grow into the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ himself. We are growing more and more together to look like Jesus. That's the purpose of the church. But our enemy, our enemy moves us quickly away from that that, that purpose, and our enemy convinces us, rather than, rather than people coming in and building up, we have people going out because we are, we are not the church that they thought we were, or our political position doesn't match their political position. People are, are leaving churches because the church is too woke, or because the church isn't woke enough, and I, I don't mean that in a biblically good way. I'm not saying that those things don't matter. What I am saying is that there is something that unites us that is greater than those things. And we have forgotten it completely. We have forgotten that it's the gospel that unites us. We've forgotten that it's the gospel that gives us our mission. That tells us what it is that the church should be doing and, and what we're about. We, 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 we are to be disciples making disciples not disciples of liberal politics, making disciples of liberal politics, disciples of Jesus, making disciples of Jesus. Instead, we have, we have become consumers, consuming. We, we would rather be in an echo chamber where all we hear is the things that we want to hear, never being challenged, always challenging someone else. We have become defenders of our way, and when we can stand together with everybody else who sees things our way, then that's the place we want to be. We have replaced Jesus with ourselves. Rather than the church pursuing the, the purpose of Jesus, we pursue our own purposes. We listen to the enemy. In chapter 4, Paul said that, that we should be gospel light in a dark and broken world. We should stand out. We should, and, and here's how, how we stand out, right? It's not because we pick it or how we vote. We should stand out in holiness and righteousness as we do life with those who are not holy and righteous. That's what Paul said. We are to be light in a dark world for others to see the light and, 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 and be, become light themselves in a dark world. Instead, what we have done is said the darkness is too dangerous. And, and, and so we don't enter into the dark world with the gospel. We, we build a wall and, and the only friends that we have in life are the safe friends who think like us, who are Christians like us. You can't be light in a dark world if you live behind the wall of light. And as a result of that, because we have withdrawn from the dangers of, of, of the darkness in the world, surrounding ourselves with other Christians, all around us the world is dying. The other extreme of that is, is that we have been convinced that we cannot be light in a dark world by being holy, and this is just as wrong. 
Our enemy would have us believe that if we, if we live with holiness and righteousness in a dark world, then we just push people away from Jesus. So the response to that is just stop living holy and righteous lives. Holy and righteous lives turn people away from Jesus. So, so we no longer call sin, sin. We no longer call the darkness, darkness. We excuse the sins of the world. We justify them. We explain away what the Bible says. And, and, and when the Bible calls it sin, we find reasons not to call it sin. And we do it all in the name of love and inclusiveness. It is a great ploy from the great liar himself, our opposition. Paul said in that same chapter, right, that even the way we gather as believers is changed by the gospel. We, sh we should be together in the gospel. Um, he talked about singing psalms and, and spiritual songs to one another as we gathered. And what Paul was doing is talking about when we gather together as the church, it should be a joyful gathering. Like, like we are excited to gather together with our brothers and sisters. This is our family. I, every week for us, when we gather together, we've been scattered throughout the week and we've been living as light in a dark world. What a relief it is when we gather together as light together, as brothers and sisters together to worship and praise God. That's what Paul says. We, we should be changed in that way. So gathering together like we gather together today is a day of joy and celebration. It's, like it's like a family reunion every week. The family reunion you want to go to. That's how it should be. Our enemy has convinced us that we don't need it. And that the church doesn't really need us. Sleeping late. A Sunday off with family turns into two Sundays and then three Sundays, and before we know it, we have drifted away from the church. And I'm not saying that family time isn't important. I am saying it can become dangerous when it replaces this family time. I'm saying when one week becomes two weeks and two weeks becomes three weeks and suddenly you don't miss the family reunion, you're not where you need to be. Our enemy says, you don't, you don't need to be there. You deserve this day off. You've worked hard all week. Hang out with your family. Enjoy the day. You don't need to be at the church. It's no big deal. The church doesn't need you there. You can catch up later online, right? It's recorded. Only you never do. And not only do you never catch up online, but, but you miss the family. You, you miss the joy of being together. You miss the, we miss the gift of you and you miss the gift of us. We have believed the lies of our enemy. Paul talks about the importance of family and we talked about that in relation to the gospel. Right? We should be gospel-centered families. The darkness has attacked the, the family from the very beginning. First murder in the Bible was family. Sometimes you feel that way, don't you? Paul reminds us that God calls husbands to, to be gospel-centered husbands. Paul reminds us, as he reminded the Ephesians, that we are called to love and lead our family, men. That, that, that we are to be present and active and to love our family like Jesus. To raise children in the, ways, in, in the ways of God and in the discipline of the Lord. Fathers, that is our responsibility. To, to sacrificially love our wife as Christ loves the church. Our enemy tells us those things don't matter. Our enemy tells us that your leadership doesn't matter. Our enemy says, listen, you worked hard all week and, and your money goes to the family and that's the way you take care of the family and that's good enough. It's a lie. culture we live in now tells us that fathers don't matter and aren't important even though studies and statistics tell us a different story but listen it's not just it's not just husbands and fathers and what our culture says about men mention the word submission and wives become angry and shut down suddenly it's not the word of god
Men, some of that is for good reason, and I covered that when we, when we preached through that, that section. Some of it is for good reason, because we have not led and loved well. And we have driven our wives to that point. But hear me. Some of it is because the enemy whispers in the ears of wives, who is he to leave you? And he speaks to our pride and rebellion. God has made marriage a beautiful partnership. Don't get me wrong on that. And, and, I, and, I, and I hope you hear me. This isn't, this isn't just the, the husband doing everything, leading everything. Marriage is a beautiful partnership. But at the end of the day in the marriage relationship, just as God came to Adam and held Adam responsible for the sin in the garden, husbands, fathers, God will come to you and you will give first account on how you loved your wife and your family. One more. Last week we talked about work and the gospel. We, we, are, we are called to be Jesus as employees and employers. That means we work like Jesus, we lead like Jesus, work is under the Lord, work hard, work honestly, work with honor and respect for your boss, bosses, for your employees, honor your employees, respect them. We were all created for this, we were all created for work. That's the picture that we get from the garden in the book of Genesis. We would be working and extending the boundaries of the garden. We would be fruitful and filling the earth with the glory of God. That's what we are supposed to be doing even now in this broken and fallen world. But our enemy has convinced us that life is broken up into sacred and secular. And when it comes to our job, see, we see sacred as that Sunday morning time. Maybe if we go to MC, that's a little less sacred, but that's sacred as well. When we go to a church event, that's our, our sacred time. Everything else is secular and completely disconnected. Our enemy would have us believe that the only thing that mattered when it came to the sacred was doing what we're doing this morning. Everything else is fine, however you want to live that. Your job, there's nothing sacred about your job. Well, make money. Make as much money as you can. That's not the way that God designed it. There is no sacred and secular divide. In the eyes of God, everything in every area of our life is sacred. It's all sacred because we are sacred. Every area of our life bears the image of God. In every area of our lives, we are being shaped into the image of Jesus. See, when we, when we don't believe that, it's okay to not put in a, an honest day's work. Because that's not sacred. But when we, when we have this sacred and secular divide, it, it's okay to be lazy when the boss isn't looking or when the boss isn't around. Nothing wrong with, with, with us taking something from the company. Bosses, there's nothing, nothing wrong with being, because, because this is not sacred, it's okay for us to be threatening to our employees, treating them like they are animals there to serve and to produce nothing wrong with paying them poorly and giving no benefits while while we take take all of it because we believe the serpent we use people we disrespect them we run shady businesses unfair practices we we, we cut corners we we don't do our best we we don't produce our best we do what we want and we serve ourselves because our job isn't sacred it's secular and it's all about me and no one sees Jesus. Christians, we should be the hardest working, most conscientious people in the workforce. We, we should be the greatest servant employees and the greatest servant bosses. Because we are being shaped into the image of Jesus. But our enemy lies And rather than hearing the word of God, we, we hear him like Eve did in the garden. In all of these areas that Paul addresses, our enemy seeks to, to steal, to kill, to destroy. He is like a roaring lion seeking to devour whomever he may. 
He is the great dragon who desires to, to rule God's creation and be worshipped as God. He opposes God. He opposes the kingdom of God. He opposes the church. He opposes the gospel. And he opposes you. Church, we have an enemy. We have an enemy. And because of him, we are not what we should be. And because we have not stood against him, the world doesn't see the beautiful kingdom of God present here and now. Here's the, here's the short of it. Our enemy has convinced us that Jesus isn't the right answer. Jesus isn't the right answer to how we work. Jesus isn't the right answer to how we, how we live as a family, husbands, wives, fathers, children. Jesus isn't the right answer for what, what unity in the church should look like. Jesus isn't the right answer for what, what unity should look like between races and people who are different. Our enemy has con convinced us that the answers come from somewhere else, that, 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 that the answers come from, from the collective wisdom and philosophies of the world that we live in. It's led us to believe that God's answers aren't true and the word of God isn't really the word of God. Just another book written by broken men. Sinful men, men who, 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 who don't really understand the world or who weren't very smart themselves, men who were too jaded by their own cultures to know what family should look like or, or who a woman should be or a man. That's what our enemy says, and far too often we listen. We are a mess. We are a mess, but we are not a hopeless mess. Listen to these words from Jesus. We have a great hope. This is from Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, the Catholic church would tell you that what Jesus was saying was that he would build his church on Peter and Peter would be the first pope. I don't believe that in the least. What Jesus was saying that he would build his church on was Peter's confession. And Peter's confession, he said, Peter, who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Christ means Messiah, Savior, the promised one. Peter is acknowledging, who do you say I am, Peter? You are the promised one. You are the one that God has promised through the prophets from the, the earliest of days, from Genesis 3.15. You are the promised one. You are the one who was promised to redeem all of humanity from sin. You were the one who was promised as the restorer, the one who would fix all of the brokenness and make things like God meant it to be in the building. You, in the beginning, you are the promised one. You're the serpent crusher. On that, Jesus says, on that good news, I will build my church. On this beautiful gospel, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. This is our hope. The gospel is our hope. The, the very thing that Satan tempts us to leave is our hope. Jesus the serpent slayer. He is our hope. I, 
I, I want you to know this week. We'll finish up next week and we'll talk more about how we fight our enemy. But I want you to know this week that we have an enemy. We have an enemy who is constantly pulling us away from the gospel. We have an enemy who is constantly whispering in our ear that, that there is a better way than Jesus. And all that God has sought to build through the gospel, our enemy is destroying every time we listen. Stop listening. Stop listening to the serpent. Stop turning to him and turn to Jesus. Turn to the gospel. Turn to Ephesians and read again and again the truth of how we are united. The truth of what makes us good husbands and good wives. Turn to the truth of God's word. Turn to the truth of, of, of what God has spoken to us in and through Jesus. Turn to that and believe. Believe who he is. Believe what he says as opposed to what our enemy says. Believe that the gospel changes everything. Believe that, that we are in a war and though the victory is ours, what brings us the victory is our faith in Jesus. Believe the good news of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you that victory isn't up to us any more than salvation is because we, we couldn't be victorious. Father, I thank you for your grace. I thank you that your loving kindness is new every day. I thank you for the good news of the gospel that is not just for believers once in their life, but, but today we need it. We need the good news of, of grace and mercy and forgiveness for all the disbelief in our lives, for all the lies that we have held as truth above your word. I pray that you would, would strengthen us today in the gospel, strengthen us today in the truth of Jesus. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would remind us, prick our hearts and send us back, back to the gospel and back to the word of God for truth. I pray, I pray that we would we would hear the lies of our enemy as they are lies. And I pray that we would be a people and a church shaped more and more into the image of Jesus and more and more into the kingdom that we should be for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We close out this morning as we do every week at New City with communion. Communion at New City is open. That means you don't have to be a member here to participate. You just need to be a follower of Christ, someone who loves Jesus. And, and if you do, communion is open to you. Communion is a celebration of all that God's done for us in Christ, not just in saving us and then leaving us, but the beauty of the gospel that even today we are forgiven and free. His loving kindness is new even today. We need that. Take a minute, I, I encourage this every week, take a minute if the Holy Spirit has convicted you of areas in your own life that you have turned from the gospel and turned from the word of God, repent of that and turn back to him, believe the good news of the gospel and celebrate Jesus today. In communion, the bread represents his body broken for us. The juice represents his blood shed for us and that we are redeemed from our sins, forgiven and made sons and daughter of the King. So take a minute, repent of your sin, and then, and then enjoy communion with Jesus. We'll have members of our prayer team down front. If you would like them to pray with you or pray for you, they'd love to do that. If you'd like to know more about what it means to love and follow Jesus, they'd really love to talk with you about that as well. Would you stand?
me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. You know 
Our God does not leave us on our own. He accomplished our redemption on the cross, and he will continue to rescue and restore us from the pain and the brokenness of this life. Paul writes in Philippians, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. God is at work now, strengthening us with his word for the fight ahead, and we are assured of victory in Christ. He is good. Amen? He's our rescuer. He's our good shepherd. He is worthy of our trust. Will you be my light when I cannot see? When I can't take another step, Lord, will you carry me?
life is over, I'm gonna live again. Gonna trade this cross for a crown. No, this is not the end. And when you call my name, I will take my rest. There's a mansion in glory, and you're gonna meet. I shall not want, I shall not want, he will wipe every tear from my eyes, and I shall not want, I shall not want, I shall not want, I'll be home in his presence forever, I shall not. For the Lord is my shepherd, for the Lord is my shepherd, for the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not This is our benediction this morning, our blessing for the road. It comes from Paul's prayer in chapter 3 of Ephesians. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. New City Church, you are sent.